morning, class. Welcome back. If you check out the notes behind me, they go along with the notes that are online on the blog and also Google Classroom, and it has to do with uh, starting off with current events. Uh, I use CNN 10 again this morning because they're doing a pretty good job of covering some of the issues with COVID-19. And also today they talk about something that's very, very important, uh, antibodies, how our bodies fight off a virus. Remember, viruses are different than bacteria. If you have a bacteria like strep throat, uh, you might take penicillin for something like that. If the bacteria, which is a living organism that invades your body, viruses are different. You might remember that they take over a cell. They're not actually living things. They're called virus particles before they enter a cell, take over the mechanism of the cell, make copies of themselves so they're very difficult to fight. You depend on our immune system to fight them. That's what's really important about that. So check out that on antibodies. And then there's one here that's a kind of more lighthearted story on slime. <laughs> yes, slime. If you check out the International Space Station story on slime, I wanted to mention that because much earlier in the year, at one point or another, we had the four fundamental forces that we know about in nature right now. And you might remember, I wrote them down over here. Gravity, weak force, electromagnetism, the strong force. Uh, certainly we always hear about gravity all the time. When you look at the International Space Station story, uh, kind of keep in mind that a lot of people think, well, there, there's no gravity up there in space. You know, there's gravity everywhere. Remember, that's a really important thing. Very often, especially middle school, high school, and beyond, you hear people say all the time, well, there's no gravity in space. There is gravity everywhere, and as a matter of fact, gravity sort of defines our universe. I hope you did that CNN experiment the other day that they showed you on trying to make fog. I tried it at home and did a little bit. We had some ice over some hot water, and very, very, very slightly you could see the, uh, the, the fog developing over the ice, the water vapor developing over the ice. In this case right here, here's a real simple one you can do for yourself, and they show slime in space. It makes a, a sphere, a circle, a perfect, a perfect sphere of slime in space because it's like water. Uh, have you ever seen someone draw a, ra uh, a, a raindrop? And you might draw the raindrop like this. That's kind of a stylized raindrop where it kind of sp uh, spreads out and, and gets wider at the bottom. It doesn't really look like that. Most raindrops, uh, depending of course on how big it is and how it's falling, are really basically spheres. They might actually get a little smushed in on the bottom because of the air resistance as it falls. But it's a sphere. Why? It has to do with something we learn about. Electromagnetism. Remember we've drawn the Mickey Mouse molecule of water in here a million times? The little molecule that looks like this. And it's got a positive side and a negative side. And because in space it's in free fall, the ISS, they are in free fall, so they're in what NASA would call microgravity. Um, it naturally forms itself into a perfect little sphere. It's very, very cool. I hope you watch the video. Here's a very quick experiment you can do at home. I don't know how this is going to work out on the video, but I'll give it a shot. If you have, for example, the water in here, and I've got a bucket down below that you can't see, so it's catching the water in the classroom, but there's water just in this little thermos right here. And if I were to take this and pour it, you'd of course expect it to fall to the ground. The water in the container is under the influence of gravity. Let's say I took this container, punched a hole in the bottom, and you expect the water to come spray it out, and that's what it does. It's under the influence of gravity. But while something is falling, while it's in the act of falling, uh, it feels no weight. It does. It, it, again, it's still under the influence of gravity, but while it's in free fall, it's not feeling any weight. Remember, the astronauts on the International Space Station are in the act of falling. They're falling around the planet because our planet is a sphere, and as they fall, the planet, if you will, is kind of moving away from them. They're trying to fall, they're trying to fall, they're trying to fall, but the planet's a sphere, and they're going fast enough um, in, a vertical, in a horizontal direction where they never actually hit the planet. You can do this. Uh, I had an old container in here. Imagine, imagine this. My container happens to be Clorox. That's what I had handy, right? Um, but I filled it with water, and again, I'm not spilling water under the floor, but it's a couple buckets down here. But it's full of water right now, and you can see the water spraying out. But I'm going to hold it way up and drop it, and while it falls, check it out. So I'm going to go over here just a little bit, so then it falls into the bucket. While it falls, I don't know if you can see it, you can always float on the video at that point. While it falls, the water is not shooting out. The water inside, during the time that it's falling, is experiencing uh, weightlessness. It's in free fall. So if you check out 
the video on the ISS today is a fun one and it's worth checking out. But there's some real science in there. You know, science of course is everywhere. We want to make sure that we check out. Yeah, it's a fun video on the slime in the International Space Station, but it's also pretty cool when you check out the, uh, the experiments that they do up there. Okay, jumping back into this, fungi evolution and photosynthesis. Um, but, excuse me, fungi evolution and respiration and photosynthesis. I want you just to remember, again, I mentioned that this chemical reaction was going to be up on the board several times this year. It's the photosynthesis reaction. And remember, carbon dioxide getting down with water, making sugar and oxygen, stepping over the buckets over here. And when you look at this reaction, it's important to remember a couple things. One, oxygen is a byproduct here. Oxygen gets topped off these, uh, this oxygen molecule. It's a diatomic molecule. It gets sent off into the atmosphere. And the early bacteria that was photosynthesizing three and a half billion years ago, when things were starting to photosynthesize on this planet, the oxygen was tossed off. They didn't want the oxygen. It wasn't needed for this reaction, if you will. It was just kind of like a byproduct that they were getting rid of. This really important thing happened. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 540 million years ago, and this is going to be more in detail on our notes, when we're talking about evolution, we're talking about the diversity of life. For billions of years, literally, life is going on, photosynthesizing its single-celled organisms, doing photosynthesis and tossing off oxygen. What we think probably happened is somewhere in the neighborhood of 540 million years ago, there was what they now call the Cambrian Explosion. This amazing diversity of life all of a sudden flourished. Animals developed. You had life going from single-celled organisms prolifer <laughs> proliferating, if I can say that correctly, all over the planet in all kinds of forms. We think probably, we're not sure, but scientists think probably one of the main things that happened is the oxygen level in our atmosphere built up enough to support complex life. So if you check out the complex life, just prior to this uh, Cambrian explosion, they call it, Fungi developed, fungi evolved. We're going to go through each of the six kingdoms of life, talk about some representative examples of each of these kingdoms. And in the case of fungi, incredibly important kingdom in terms of being able to return to the environment the chemicals that are needed for life to continue. They're recyclers. Those who went to outdoor ed might remember this right here. They were doing the FBI song. They were singing the FBI song at the campfire. Uh, it stood for fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates. These are the big three that return things to the environment, that recycle things in a forest they can use again. The first one we're going to talk about in class in terms of how they do it is the fungus, the fungi kingdom. And if you check out the fungus kingdom, incredibly diverse, incredibly important, and absolutely critical to recycling. We've talked a lot about cycles in nature. We've talked about the carbon cycle, uh, the water cycle, the rock cycle. Fungi are absolutely critical to life for recycling things in nature, for making sure that living things have the chemicals available so that they can continue to contribute to and take from the cycles in nature. So if you check out very, very quickly, photosynthesis and respiration. Uh, the photosynthesizers in the early, on the early Earth and the plants now, they're getting rid of the oxygen. Those of us who engage in respiration, basically cellular respiration, essentially you can think of it right for now as breathing, we're doing the opposite of that. We're taking the sugar, we're saying, well, thank you very, very much photosynthesizers for taking the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and taking the water and putting it together to make sugar and by the way, getting rid of, thank you very, very much for doing that photosynthesizers. We are now going to come along and we are going to eat the sugar. We're going to breathe the oxygen. And we're also going to make these very, very important chemicals, which again, we'll check out in our notes in a lot of detail, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Think of it kind of like your, your bank account of energy that your body uses. So if you look at the photosynthesizers, they're doing a fantastic job of taking the raw materials, carbon dioxide, water, turning it into sugar, and getting rid of the oxygen. Uh, the animals, 
especially that came along after 540 million years ago during the Cambrian explosion. The animals being grateful said, thank you very, very much. We're not going to eat those sugars. We're now going to breathe that oxygen. And we are doing the exact opposite, contributing to yet another cycle of nature, which is amazingly awesome and very, very cool. Um, with the prolifer proliferation of life, fungi are important for recycling and returning chemicals to the ecosystem. Uh, that will be part of the reading that we'll put out there online. And what fungus produced food did you eat today? This is your challenge. I'd like you to think about this for yourself. Think about, when you check out the reading, check out what food that you probably had today that was produced by, or perhaps was, a fungus. So the most obvious, of course, would be a mushroom. Um, but let's just say you didn't have you know, a, a mushroom uh, you know, on your sandwich or a mushroom in your soup or whatever it was you're cooking up today. I'd like you to think about the things that you ate. If you're not sure, well, I'll give you a couple of hints when we check out the notes online. I'm going to go to the Google Classroom later on. I'll put a list of some things out that are either produced by fungus or you know, contribute in some way to the food production. So, as we go through, quick recap, as we go through the six kingdoms of life, I want you to think about fungus uh, first and how they're important for recycling, how they're important for helping us eat, and how they're a really kind of an interesting kingdom in terms of uh, they are one of the most important and diverse kingdoms um, of all of the six that we're studying in this class. Hope you're having a great day and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.